thank you, Baby Tim. Okay, now we have five minutes each uh, to counter argue. Uh, Professor Terence Gomez, you would start your counter arguments and proposals. I agree with Baby Tim on one point. The younger generation in the opposition, I think, are of a different ilk. They truly seem to be sincere about wanting to have uh, reforms, including of the sort that we are discussing today. My concern is this, and I put why we sit in the category of young people who want uh, serious about reforms. My concern is this, do the leaders of the party support the reforms that we are talking about? I put this position to him during my debate, and I said, will your party leaders support it? He didn't answer the question, maybe he's waiting for the next round to answer it, but I don't want him to run away from answering the question. Answer the question. Will your party leaders support this? Okay, why, wait, let me finish, I've got five minutes. <laughs> oh, it's like five minutes ago. Yes, and then we'll have to debate. Yeah. Why we see, said, we get a lot of money from donations. It's kept a living day out of me. Because Najib Razak said the same thing. <laughs> the question is not about the donations. The question that I put to Wiley Sin is this. Will you disclose the sources of your donation? Will you be accountable to us about where you get your money from? I have full sympathy for everything that he said about how parties need money. The purpose of the campaign, and it's out there for you all if you want it, it's out there. Please take it. The purpose of the campaign is to help these parties get money, but money in a way which is totally transparent. And for whatever money they get, and we propose to state funding, government funding of parties, they must account for every cent that they get from us. That is the point. It's not a question of which model, there are 101 models, we have the models here too. The question is this, will you tell us not only the state funding, but also the private funding, are you going to disclose your sources to us? The second issue, he brought up this point that Pakistan National is getting a lot of money from big business. Yes, we know that. My argument to him now is this, small sized companies, medium sized companies are now supporting the opposition and a larger number of small scale enterprises and medium scale enterprises than big businesses. So in fact, it may be the case that the opposition is now getting access to a lot more money than the Pakistan National. <laughs> I put it to you, you tell me how I'm wrong, tell me where you get the money from and if you are getting money from businesses, tell me now, who are the businesses that are giving you money, tell us now how much money they're giving you, tell us also please, what is the quid pro quo, after all businesses don't give you money for nothing, they expect something in terms of public policy and what is happening, let's say, case of Penang, what kinds of developmental processes are happening in Penang? which really, you will say, is in the interest of the Rakyat and not so much the interest of the businesses that are funding the parties. The third issue, and I said this earlier, he did not address this point. We can talk about reforms and, uh, 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 at the national level, but the reforms that really need to be done are the internal party reforms. He did not say a word about how his party runs his internal party elections. He did not respond to my allegation that there is monetized elections in his own party too. It was reported in the press too. And the party was deeply divided because of the monetization of uh, the political system in his own party. What are the reforms in the party about this thing? And finally, the PM's finance reform that he said that he's going to introduce on the reform of politics. He said that as soon as he came to power. This is the case. As soon as he came to power, he said, we are going to stop rent-seeking and patronage. We are going to introduce the political parties act. Yes, that's true. All that is true. But Mandu was a step, set up a committee to look into the reform of the finance and politics. All that came to a close very quickly. I've seen the documents in Mandu. Do you know how many pages they devoted to the reforming of politics? Two. And that's it. Soon after that, not long later, Najib was the shock of that. After the donation scandal, he said he's forming a cabinet committee. Yes, that's true too. I was invited to join the cabinet committee. I went. And when I listened to what they were saying, I said, this is not good enough. You must also have institutional reforms. They only said, we will do legislative reforms. No institutional reforms. I said, what's the point? And so I didn't join the cabinet committee. Or that's called. So, 
He is right on that. But my counter to him is this. At least Najib is talking about reforms and he set up a committee on this matter and we can debate it when he puts it out there for us to debate it. Has the opposition come out with any reform agenda on the financing of politics? And this is where they've been complaining to us about how bad what MDB is in terms of donations flowing into the political system. So let me end there and why we sit. I look forward to your response. Thank you very much. Huh? Okay, it's like you know, I'm, uh, is uh, we. I have this uh, this idealism as well as uh, this. It is hopefully the idealism to stand here to put forth. It's not an easy place to be here, first of all, because I know that I'll get reading and all this. And uh, but I I wanted to state the point here because I know if I reject, a lot of people rejected this. Uh, I heard that from the organizer, a lot of people rejected this, including Paris National. We hope that Paris National will be here so that they can answer a lot of questions. But it's, uh, uh, then it ended up me here to answer this question. So, but I want to stay here. We, we, uh, I'm here because I wanted this reform to, be happen, to happen. Because I see the future and I say that this is not good. For anyone, for political parties, no matter it's opposition or whatever, if the system continues, the competition between the uh, uh, political parties is so bad, huh? so toxic that you are you you are forced to that route. So, will the part political parties support reform? I will tell you though uh, this very simple thing: politicians react to the uh, to the to the rakyat. If all the rakyats are standing up to say, hey, you have to reform yourself, then political parties and politicians will all react to it. Okay? That's a fact. That's why I'm here. I want to keep this debate. I want to promote and provoke debates among not only uh, in, among the politicians and uh, uh, politicians and my colleagues as well. So that they know that we have to uh, uh, we have to do reforms. So that to protect our future, because I believe that I wanted to stay in politics for long term. Okay, I cannot allow politics to ruin my our future. Will the political parties disclose? Uh, it look, looks like I'm all defending now. <laughs> Unfortunately, will the political parties disclose source? Let me tell you a, a simple example. There was a, a big corporation. Uh, what they call? In during the general election, who openly say that they support opposition. You know what happened after the general election? Uh, the CEO sued, uh, the income tax went to the company and have a criminal prosecution against him for evading tax evasion. So actually it sent shivers across all uh, uh, big corporations that they cannot uh, support opposition. So now, if you say, I tell you, uh, corporations would not want to uh, donate to the opposition because of that case. You see? So you say a lot of SMEs are supporting uh, opposition. I tell you that is totally untrue. Or else we will be not so struggling. We are struggling actually. That's why we are forced to have this small sum donation, RM26 only from the Raghya, and hopefully. Everyone here can donate to and go to our website and donate to us because they are struggling with uh, what they call donations uh, and big corporations are uh, you know they don't want to enter they don't want to enter this murky world of donation political donations anymore. Then uh, and um, let's say how do we uh, in the state of Penang uh, you say this uh, there are allegations of corporations. And etc. on development projects, but we institute open tender. There are open tender, and corporation uh, companies go in and compete, and eventually the winners uh, got it and is open, and also accountable. There are freedom of information act that you can go and check the, the facts. The same thing is slang of freedom of information as well as this open tender is practiced. So there is no, uh, if let's say we have institutionalized 
all these reforms, there's very hard, the, the corporation will find it very hard to influence uh, development uh, project decisions. Uh, we are uh, involved in money politics, I would say I was a candidate in uh, my party election. Let me tell you the truth. I spent all the money, all totally, I think, less than 2,000 ringgit in my party election. And it's all only my personal traveling, flights, etc. And buy some kuei to, you know, and we chip in money to buy kuei. And I, I got it quite not bad. I only lost by 72 votes. And many of my colleagues actually, same thing like we do. But they all become the Majlis Bintina Pusat. So to say that body politics is involved, huge money, nothing. I tell you, yeah, small kuei kuei and all this. You'll definitely have to, huh? That's, you know, if you don't bring kuei or belanja makan, surely they say, how can you come and ask for uh, our, and then you don't have anything to, and uh, just makan makan. So that's a reality in uh, my party. Uh, in my party. I cannot ask a question, okay, because I keep defending. Will the civil society and the political part, uh, I mean the civil society, actually, you can talk a lot, very condescending, you know, oh, like, you have to do this and do that, uh, or your party also like that. But when we come, we need the money for uh, an voter certification campaign. None. That, that hardly any support from the civil society to say, hey, yes, we support this political finance. Please donate to rm26.my. And we are really struggling because there's no money. And how do we go to uh, our elections without uh, support from you know uh, general public? You know you can easily say this and that, but eventually I feel that relations are not coming up or strong enough uh, to 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 support uh, what the call people with who wants change in this country, political party who wants change in this country. You know, uh, if you expect, if we don't have enough support of political small sum donations to uh, struggling opposition, well, opposition will be wiped out. That is my question to uh, Professor. How are we going to survive without, you know, in this environment, without any support, money, and go into election? We will be wiped out. With the, you know, versus the 2.6 billion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, oh, um, okay, that was running on water time because <laughs> your time was up. Um, okay, my task here is uh, your counter argument time is uh, currently over. We are now going to open the floor to comments and questions. Uh, and you've got quite, a, quite some time to do this. And I want this to be as provocative as uh, hot. It's very hot here, listening to the two people, it's very hot being on the stage here. But I want the questions and answers to be as equally uh, challenging to our minds because what we need to do is eventually to come up with something that could work. Now, you have time to present questions uh, to both speakers, but I will take three questions at a time. And then, if you have a question specifically to either presenter or debater, name them. Uh, first of all, introduce yourself. Be very short with your question. No long speeches, no long analysis, and so on. So you give everybody more time. But make sure you are very uh, clear with what you're asking. And provoke, please provoke, because this is a session to get as much information as possible. So can I see the first three hands? I see one. Uh, Any more? Two? Three. Okay, first person. Can you give us some example of any country that has a similar uh, unregulated political financing uh, situation like, like in Malaysia that has successfully reformed? Okay, and also, have you, you mean you've talked a lot about UMNO and PKR. Is there anything that you can say about DAP maybe or any other parties as well? And will you not support Mahadi now, although he has a lot of stuff, baggage, but you know, it may be the right time to have reforms. Thank you. And they have a specific allocation for them uh, to spend for the development of their people, for their constituency. But I think there's rampant cases. They use the allocation to fund political activities. So what is your take on that? And the second question is regarding to the 
you know, you can see that there's a trend of having a lot of uh, political think tank advocated by the political parties, and then they try to manage to get some fund from overseas and to fund their political activities. Um, what is your take on that? Okay, that's all. Thank you. My, my name is Himanshu. I'm just uh, uh, very curious to know, uh, uh, Dr. Terence Gomez, and also why we see the real political parties that uh, I feel really uh, sympathetic for are the Minos, you know. Uh, like, for example, in my opinion, Party Socialist Malaysia. I mean, these people, these, these parties such as these, in my opinion, have such a disciplined, restricted, and, uh, and modest uh, 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 stand on political funding. So under the current circumstances, where the mainstream media and the official government machinery are so restrictive in allowing access uh, for such parties to reach out with their messages to the public, does this mean that uh, how can these kind of parties actually rise up and uh, and uh, uh, communicate and influence uh, their, their stance to the to the general public? It's as if these kind of parties will never be able to to come up. Uh, as a politician, a well-known billionaire in America is now saying, you know, he's funding his own campaign and. Uh, nobody gives him credit about it, but that's just a joke. <laughs> okay, thank you. I told Webisim I'll be very provocative, and I was. Uh, and I'm glad that he's been trying to take on the issues that we have put in. But I want to be very clear, I'm also very sympathetic to Webisim and his position uh, on this matter. I do acknowledge that he has a lot of problems that he has to deal with, including within the party. Having said that, let me move first to the questions raised by by Pickery. Pickery's first question is on unregulated reform and how have countries, how many countries have moved into that form where there have been changes. Let me say this: seventy percent of democracies around the world, seventy percent of countries around the world have changed their electoral system primarily in one form. They now go for state funding of elections. That is a major reform. Some countries have been very reluctant to do it, and one country that was very reluctant to do it was the United Kingdom. And interestingly enough, UK, US has it, but not in the form that we are talking about. Sin brought up the case of Germany as a very good example, but closer to home, countries which have seen this kind of major reforms include former authoritarian countries such as South Korea and Taiwan. If you want to see real reforms where they have changed their electoral system to make it a real level playing field, go to Korea, go to Taiwan. Taiwan is extremely interesting because Taiwan was a case where they had a party like Amno, a single dominant party like Amno called the KMT, the Kuomintang. The Kuomintang, like Amno, was very involved in business. They had a lot of control of the corporate sector and they reformed. But they only reformed after KMT lost power. And then they divested their assets and they moved into, you can see a whole range of electoral reforms going on there. So the issues that we are debating in our country today is not unique. We have seen it in other countries in Asia too, countries which have begun the democratization process. It's not easy. This is a debate that we all need to have, and I'm glad we have it because we have to move in that direction. So that speaks to the question, the last question about PSL, for example. I agree with you completely. PSL is probably the only party I've met which is totally behind this, completely in support of this. And to support parties like PSM, we need reforms of the sort that we're talking about here that includes state funding for political parties that have captured electoral representation in parliament. Otherwise, how are you going to do all the things that uh, Wadi Sin said? How are you going to pay for their campaigns? How are you going to pay for their education? How are you going to pay for their uh, party missionary? These are actual expenses. I told you the campaign here, that the proposals we have offering here is to help the parties so that they can run themselves in a manner in which they have access to sufficient funding to serve the electorate. That is the way it should be. They cannot be having dinners every other night to raise money so that they can pay for their expenses. That is not their work. I've said this to, uh, to my friends in the opposition. How many dinners are you going to have every week? When are you doing your constancy work? When are you doing your policy work? When are you doing your think tank? So these reforms are required. It will support also small parties like PSM and new parties that are trying to come to the, come to the fore. The second question, 
I've spoken a lot about uh, UMNO and PKR. I haven't said anything about the DAP. <laughs> well, the DAP isn't here to debate with us. Why are you asking me what's happening in the DAP? Ask the DAP. Not me. <laughs> I, I won't ask. I won't ask Sid. How will Sid know what's happening in the DAP? But my question is this: Have you put the question? I have put the question to the DAP. The DAP is not coming forth on this matter. The DAP didn't support us in back in 2009-2010 when we submitted the proposals. Recently, I was at a debate with uh, Tony Kua and I raised the same points. And Tony Kua said the same thing. You know, if we have these reforms, if we don't have institutional reforms, then it's not going to help anybody. I agree. But he's not telling us anything new. He's not saying, I will support you if you have institutional reforms. The question is this. We are now coming with institutional reforms and legislative reforms. Why are you still saying no? My own feeling is that we are getting money from sources in such high numbers that it's not in their interest to say no. It's in their interest to say no to these reforms. Now the third question, and probably victory is trying to be provocative here by asking me what I think about Mahathe and Mahathe's view, what happened yesterday, which which was historic. I never thought I'd see Mahathe sitting at the same table with Lin Kitsyang. <laughs> I never thought I'd hear Lin Kitsyang saying we need Mahathe out to bring about reforms. <laughs> Especially when we know that it all started with Mahathe. Yesterday I had a similar discussion with Cynthia. We are troubled by these times that Mahathe is our saviour what an irony, the man who started all this nonsense is now our saviour. But as troubling as these arguments are about Mahathir's involvement now even with the opposition to try and bring about the reforms that we are talking about, let me say this. Uh, I have to admit, I think we need Mahathir's help. I have to admit that. As much as it's difficult for me to say because I know the history, I've given you all the history, I've written books on this matter. He said it, he read the books. For us now, we have to come to this point where we have to ask to say, look, okay, Mahathir has to be involved in this process. It's extremely painful. But Mahathir is important because if you see democratization processes occur around the world, in countries where they shifted from authoritarian rule to democracy, it primarily happened because of intra-elite feuding. What we are seeing is an intra-elite feud. A Prime Minister versus an ex-Prime Minister, both highly influential. When that intra-elite feuding spills into mainstream politics, that's when it really gets interesting. That's when you see change. Take the case of Marcos in the Philippines. Marcos had uh, all the institutions behind him, including the army. It's when there was a strong civil society movement and when the elite fractured, and they began to then mount a campaign with civil society, Marcos fell. The second example and more recent example is the case of Indonesia. Suharto was very repressive. It was only when the elites fractured because of a campaign from civil society did Suharto fall. When we know this history and when we look at Malaysia, let's put this in context. This is a situation where we are in dire straits. What Najib is doing is not good. He is not accounting for what he has done. I fear greater repression as more disclosures are made. I am deeply upset with the cabinet because the cabinet has got absolutely no credibility. How can they endorse a uh, prime minister when there is so much evidence of so many allegations of wrongdoing which he has to account for? The party, senior party leadership in Amnok is not willing to bring about the reform. So this is good. What has happened is interesting. It is historical what we are seeing. It may be the agent that will provoke the change that I think this country needs. Let me move on to the next question. One million for uh, constancy work. Yes, that's true. But let me say this. That one million is only for me and people, you know. Opposition members. This is state funding. Us, why be sin whether he is getting access to this one million? I mean, but it, oh, it's five million. That's even worse than I thought. <laughs> Barisan National is getting the Barisan MPs get it. 
It's for constituency work. What they do with it, I don't know. So much for the disclosure I've been asking for. Nobody wants to disclose what they do with all that money. Whether the money goes into the party coffers or into their own pockets, we don't know. Let them account for it. But this is true. There is money, this is state funding. So who is to say now that we cannot have state funding for our elected reps? It's already happening. So I'm glad that question has been raised because it shows that we still, we actually do have a system of state funding for our elected reps. But it is not fair because the opposition is not privy to that kind of money. The idea of King Tanks, that is a very good question. We have King Tanks. PKN has got a King Tank. DAP has got their think tanks. But I have best the thinking. What happened to all the policies? Where are all the policies? Where are all the real reforms that we are talking about? The opposition today acts like an opposition who has always been in opposition. They react to issues. I am saying this to you because if you look at the election manifesto of 2013, compare the election manifesto of the opposition with that of the Marisa National. When we look at it, we couldn't see any difference. They're on the same page. What reforms are the opposition talking about? In fact, in the 2013 election, there was a big debate between the between Pakatan Rakyat and Marisa National as to where these ideas in the manifestos first came from. Pakatan said it's from us. Marisa said you stole our ideas. There is no fundamental difference to my mind in terms of public policies between the Barisan National and the Bakhana Protect. That is my biggest fear today about our political system. Let me tell you a story to show you how, why I am saying this. When we had the global financial crisis in 2008, Najib, when he became Prime Minister the following year, said, I'm going to create a new model. And he subsequently came up with what is known as a new economic model, the NEM, and he tabled it in Parliament. As soon as he tabled it in Parliament, opposition leader, Anwar Ibrahim, stormed out of the chamber, called for a press conference and said, Najib stole all my ideas. We were shocked. Why is Anwar, the opposition leader, saying they stole his ideas? And then when we saw the new economic model, we were equally shocked because the ideas were basically ideas that were implemented during Mahathir's time. State intervention developmental state model ideas it's still intervening in the economy in a big way, and neoliberal privatization like this, and throw into the spot affirmative action. These were all Mahathir's ideas. Najib was rehashing these ideas, and Anwar was claiming ownership. So the point on the think tank is very important, because my question is this, where is the alternative policy? As I said, they are, they are saying they completely disregard they completely disregard the cabinet committee set up by uh, Najib on the reforms of politics. Where is your reform agenda? That is my biggest fear. They have not spent enough time thinking of real change, real policies that speak a different tune to what we are hearing from the Barsa National. Okay, thank you. Uh, first, I want to say that uh, thank you for uh, Professor Terence uh, for agreeing with us uh, that only the fall of Amno Barista National can bring in reform, especially in political uh, financing reform. Because in all over the country, all over the world, only changing of uh, political parties that uh, a smaller, uh, what they call this David kind of small political parties will in bring in the reform to level the playing field. So I hope that we can uh, win the next general election so that we can bring in reform. You want to hope for Barisan National? Sorry lah. Okay. Um, second thing is that I want to say is uh, Professor Gomez said that uh, we are not uh, having new ideas or policy reforms. Uh, that's our fact. Okay. In 2007, when I was working as uh, Anwar's political secretary, we launched uh, what they call uh, Agenda Economy Malaysia, AEM. Okay? But uh, basically, we articulate that affirmative, affirmative actions shouldn't be based on race, but based on needs. And we have articulated it that because we believe that by helping the, what you call, based on needs, you don't have this uh, big uh, tycoon, Bumiputra, uh, big businesses can buy a, 
uh, bungalow and get still get the five percent uh, when we could try to discount. All right. So this has created a, a lot of debates during that time. Maybe uh, because we are we don't have the media, so many people didn't know about it. But basically, the whole idea is that we have to reform the current uh, what they call affirmative actions, uh, so that the the really need the people who really need. Uh, whom are actually majority are still the Malays, okay, and a lot of Indians, and maybe pockets of Chinese urban poor, uh, especially Sabah and Sarawak. Also, the what they call the Bumi Putra Sabah and Sarawak will benefit from this uh, affirmative action. We we I think that is what we articulated during in 2007 before the 2008 election. Uh, that's why we uh, when Anwar stormed out from the parliament because this is basically what uh, 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 what it is Najib. Stole the idea. Basically, uh, Najib uh, and the Barisan National have they, they are bankrupt of new ideas. Let me give you another uh, example. When we when we uh, when we articulate for free education uh, for the university students, uh, actually we, we promoted it. Okay, and then eventually, uh, Kyrie has to debate Rafizi on the free education, and he basically said he. he they cannot be done. But we calculated it and we say free education is possible using the German model. And another thing that we propose, which is copied by Palestine National, is Turunkan Haga Kreta. We believe that by slashing this uh, excise duty, uh, we make the car cheaper for Malaysians so that the people who really need car, uh, especially the first fresh graduates, you know, don't have to take up so much loan just to service a car and then they cannot, they don't have disposable income for other things to, to set up their families, etc. Uh, this uh, Topa, the most, this uh, minister of BT, took up this idea and in their manifesto, they say that car will be slashed 20 uh, to 30% by the next uh, general election, 2018. But now you, you can you know that all cars are going up, the prices of cars are all going up, and uh, I put in a new question this, uh, this next week, that whether uh, they can achieve the target of their manifesto. So, a, a lot of ideas, including another one is affordable housing. This is what I articulated when I was a state assemblyman in Penang. I said that we need affordable housing that is about 100,000, 200, and 300,000. And the state government took it up. Then, uh, only the, uh, the federal government come in with prima programs uh, or basically copy our entire ideas. So to say that we have no new ideas that's not fair to us because we really work hard on new ideas, etc. And to say that, uh, and also uh, think tanks, uh, yeah, basically uh, constituency, constituency funds. I personally feel very badly because uh, every year they give 5 million to the uh, Barista National uh, uh, this Members of Parliament. But basically, opposition parliaments are denied of any uh, funding for that. That funding is supposed to have development projects. Uh, for example, start the roads, okay? uh, or maybe fix uh, some of the water tanks. In, you know, but I heard a lot of leakages. They basically, I heard, uh, I have no proof, but they will use this money for you know, other activities than what you say, political activities. So this is what the reality is about uh, in the state of uh, political finance in Malaysia. Okay, thank you very much. We can we can see now the